Hello and welcome back in day 194 as we dive into 2 Chronicles 27 and Isaiah chapter 9 through 12. Now, after Isaiah's death, there was uncertainty. We understand that. You never know what the next king is going to be like. But thankfully, Jotham assumes the throne. That's the son of Uzziah. He did, as the Bible describes, it what was right in the sight of the Lord. He learned from his father both his good and bad, things he needed to change and things that he could follow. He did not enter the temple like his father did. He did all that his father had done that was uh, pleasing to God, and Jotham became mighty, the Bible says, because he followed God. That's an inspiration for all of us, that there are fringe benefits that each and every one of us receive as we dedicate our lives fully to God. This becomes the backdrop for the life in Israel during Isaiah's lifespan. The people rebelled and they grew more wicked. This is the culture of the day, hour of which Isaiah is living in. Now in chapter 9, uh, it unveils Israel's uh, twofold hope that is in the midst of this wickedness and this evil and this uh, slippery slope that seems to continue to get progressively worse, there are two things that we find in this book that's encouraging. First, redemption uh, at the Messiah's first uh, advent. So it addresses, which is a unique aspect of Isaiah because it addresses both the first coming of the Messiah and his second appearance. And so these things are uh, simultaneously discussed. And so he deals with the redemption of Israel, or the redemption of mankind through Messiah's first advent, and then secondly addresses the millennial rule of the Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says here, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and we know that that is reference to the light of Jesus Christ. When he came into the world, uh, he brought the light, the new hope of redemption to mankind. And then this the passage familiar, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And so now we see this as it projects to the end, where this eternal kingdom established, the Messiah will rule without end. It will be an eternal reign. And uh, so we got both the first and the second coming and the distinctions that are laid down here. Much is discussed in the book of Isaiah, um, and it's, uh, sometimes it, it moves back and forth, and, uh, and it can become very confusing. All the prophecies that Isaiah is uh, raising up that God's given to him center around the dealings of God with, with Israel in the end times, which is interesting because there are parts of it that deal with immediate and how God's going to address that with judgment, but then it projects further down. In fact, many hundreds of years, 700 years before the coming of Jesus, we have prophecies that I just read pertaining to his first advent. Now think about how many uh, thousands of years these prophecies describing what it will be like when Christ the Messiah returns the second time. Now, this uh, picture that is projected here in the future is that of judgment, especially as it's associated with tribulation, this national, worldwide tribulation, or what's referenced as the rod, that's going to fall upon Israel, a period when Israel will be gathered back to her land after having been scattered, and that will come a day in which they will undergo the greatest trouble the world has ever seen or will see. And that's those references of Jesus saying it. We're better, you know, that uh, you're not with child, that they should flee to the mountain. It's going to be an terribly uh, difficult and tra traumatic time. The Messiah will be God's scourge to destroy the future Antichrist. And we know all the, history, all the references in both Isaiah and then with, with uh, Daniel and then the book of Revelation that describes in detail that we could not possibly cover uh, in these few moments here. But no doubt, references here that we've read today are pointing to the final great battle of Armageddon, where the Lord Jesus will return, and, uh, it, and the reign of Christ will be assumed, the perfect age as the Bible describes it. In fact, we read references here of six kinds of animals that are going to be tamed by the Messiah, that's going to transition 
a life as we know it, uh, wolves and lepers and lions and bears and cobras and vipers. These are, these are things that will suddenly their, their temperament will be tamed. Uh, nursing babies playing at a viper's den. This is, this is not mere symbolism, but this is actual transformation in which we see all animals will become as vegetarians and uh, no way we can no way we could cover all this but but it is fascinating that that what we have here is is that god is restoring the earth back to its original design it's it's what god has promised through jesus christ that all creation groans for its redemption and the coming there's coming a day in which the messiah will come and he'll put an end to all wickedness and it's going to be uh, the curse is going to be broken christ is going to be the supreme ruler it will be the perfect age and we are going to see a world in which uh, from very ground, the land of Israel, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and he's going to reign. All of this gives us hope, both for the present and for the future. We are Gentiles that are in this Gentile age where we are blessed with being grafted in uh, to the Abrahamic covenant. And so we become the sons and daughters of the covenant. But uh, we are, uh, we then also recognize the day is coming in which that will end. And then the Jewish period will, will, will be introduced and the Jews will discover that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one that they had rejected. And so for us, it's hope. We know that we're living under the covenant promise. At the same time, we're looking forward to this great national, worldwide awakening when the Jew will recognize who Jesus is and come back to Christ.